Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And for today's story, we are talking about a team that has lost over 17,000 games in the last 69 years. In fact, you could count all of their victories on one hand. Officially, they have only five wins in their entire history. Now, technically, it's possible that they have a few more wins than that, but unfortunately, we don't have complete records since the team goes back to before anyone put priority on saving those old paper box scores. And if you're doing the math, you may have already realized that 17,000 losses in 69 years works out to around 250 losses per year. That's enough to cause any player or coach to think to themselves, why are we even doing this? They have no home court, they are constantly on the road, and have played games in approximately 200 different countries. But to tell their story, I have to go all the way back to the Harlem Globetrotters. Now, I won't give you the entire Globetrotters history in this episode, because this story is about the Generals. But if you want to hear more about the Globetrotters and how they got started, go back and download episode 10, where I covered the mysterious origin story of the famous Harlem Globetrotters. But in order to tell you the story of the Washington Generals, I do need to take you back to the year 1950. At this point, the Harlem Globetrotters are transitioning from a regular competitive basketball team to a basketball-themed comedy group. The Globetrotters are one of the best barnstorming teams in the country from the 1920s to the early 1950s. But as the NBA was becoming a stable and financially successful league, many of those barnstorming teams began to go out of business in the late 1940s and early 1950s. They could no longer recruit the best players because the best players were all playing in the NBA. The Globetrotters realized they needed to change their business model since there was nobody left to play and they would also go out of business. It was basically a situation of adapt or disappear. So as the Globetrotters were becoming a comedy group, they needed another team to play against. And I say the word play with air quotes. With any good comedy duo like Laurel and Hardy or Martin Lewis or George and Gracie Burns, you need one part of the duo to be the funny one and the other part of the duo plays the role of the straight man. The straight man is the one who sets up the joke so that the funny one can deliver the punchline. The Globetrotters were the funny ones, and they needed a team to play the role of straight man and help them set up their routines, or as the Globetrotters refer to them, their comedy reams. Globetrotters owner Abe Saperstein remembered an old friend who had beaten the Globetrotters a couple of times in competitive games as a member of the Philadelphia Spas. That friend was Louis Klotz, more affectionately known as Red Klotz. Klotz was now the owner of the Spas, so Saperstein asked Klotz if he would bring his team to travel with the Globetrotters and play the role of the opponent. Saperstein even loaned Klotz $1,500 to buy a DeSoto in order to drive the team around on tour with the Globetrotters. And if you want to hear more about the Philadelphia Spas, go and check out episode 31 from just a few weeks ago. Now let me tell you a little bit about Red Klotz before we continue. 
Klotz played his college ball at Villanova University, where he was known as a sharpshooter. It's not a stretch to say that he was the Ray Allen of his day. He had an uncanny ability to switch the ball from really long distances, and that led Klotz to a short but successful NBA career. He only ever played in 11 regular season NBA games and six playoff games. But he won a championship. In fact, Klotz still holds the record for being the shortest player to ever win a championship in the NBA. He was only five foot seven or 170 centimeters. And he played for the 1948 Baltimore Bullets, the only team to win an NBA championship and then go out of business. They are a completely different team from the Washington Bullets, who are now known as the Washington Wizards. But by 1950, he was out of the NBA and running the spas. And he was in a very similar predicament that the Globetrotters were in. With the NBA recruiting the best players, barnstorming teams were going out of business right and left. The barnstorming teams were losing the battle with the NBA for the hard-earned money of the typical basketball fan. This means that teams like the Spas and the Globetrotters had fewer teams to play against. And that's when his friend Abe Saperstein of the Globetrotters came to him with an offer to be the Globetrotters' opponent for a tour. The tour was very successful. They played lots of games and collected a lot of ticket revenue, which the teams shared. So they organized another successful tour. In 1952, Saperstein and Klotz decided to make their arrangement more formal. That was the year that the Klotz team would become the permanent opponent of the Globetrotters. And he decided to start playing under a new name, the Washington Generals in honor of General Dwight Eisenhower, who successfully led the American troops in Europe during World War II. General Eisenhower would later serve as the President of the United States. Klotz selected green as the primary color of the uniform with some yellow trim. The next thing he had to do was find some players who could stay on tour for lengthy periods of time. He signed players to contracts and everything just like any professional team would but they were always a separate organization from the Globetrotters. They were two organizations with a contract to go on tour together to put on their shows. And they did that for decades. Klotz would even suit up for the Generals as their player coach. In fact, he continued to suit up for the Generals into his 50s before retiring to become only the coach, general manager, and the owner of the team. And he always insisted that the Generals played to win. They were never playing to lose. And that caught me by surprise during my research. But here is how they explain it. In any given Globetrotter show, about 40% of the game is actual basketball, where the players from both teams are playing for real. And this is where the Generals are actually trying to score as much as possible and play good defense on the other end. Keep in mind that all of the players on the Generals are former college players and sometimes even former professionals who played in the minor leagues or overseas. I mean, they are not NBA level players, but they are still serious professional players who can really play. Now the other 60% of the game consists of comedy routines that the Globetrotters are famous for. The rule for the Generals players is that they are not to interfere with the comedy routines. They are supposed to play along and let the Globetrotters do their thing. When the Globetrotters put one guy on the shoulders of his teammate and then just walk the ball all the way to the basket and score, well, the Generals are just supposed to let it happen. Also, when one of the Generals players is about to shoot a free throw and he's given the helium ball, he knows he's going to miss the free throw because the ball is going to float up into the rafters as soon as he releases it, never to be seen again. For the Generals, it's like playing a game of chess, except that before the game even starts, you have to remove one of your rooks, one of your knights, one of your bishops, and your queen, and then still try to win the game. You are facing an uphill battle as soon as the game starts. But, once every 15 or 20 years or so, you might actually win one. And that's exactly what happened in 1971. And I'm going to share that story right after this break.
This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show. And now I need to tell you about the most famous time that the Generals actually beat the Globetrotters. It wasn't the only time that the Generals won, but it was the most famous. The Generals had actually beaten the Globetrotters in 1954 and in 1958. But the time they beat the Globetrotters in 1971 is the one that is most often talked about. The game was played in Martin, Tennessee. At this point in their history, the Globetrotters are led by Meadowlark Lemon, the clown prince of basketball, and Curly Neal was their dribbling specialist. The 1970s were probably when the Globetrotters were at their height of popularity. They were on national television in the United States several times every year. They were in a movie or two and even guest starred on the Scooby-Doo cartoon show. Unfortunately for the Globetrotters, Curly Neal was injured that night and wasn't going to play. So the Generals really took advantage of that 40% of the game that was for real. They scored in bunches and built quite a lead over the Globetrotters. Even with all of their comedy routines to get easy baskets, the game was a close one at the end. It was really exciting for the fans. At this point, the Globetrotters had won the previous 2,495 games in a row over the Generals. And as the game is coming down to the end, the Globetrotters are leading 99-98, to and the Generals have the ball for the final shot. Red Klotz, who was 50 years old at the time, drew up a play for himself to take the final shot of the game. Now, one thing I have learned from my own observation is that as players get older, they lose most of their speed and jumping ability and some of their athleticism. But one thing that older players never lose is their ability to shoot. Shooters can always shoot the ball, no matter how old they get. And 50-year-old Red Klotz shot the ball from long distance as the clock was running out. The ball seemed to hang in the air forever before it finally dropped through the net. The Generals had won the game. They actually won. The final score was 100-99. to The Generals players were so ecstatic that they hoisted Klotz onto their shoulders and carried him off into the locker room. They had actually done it. For the fans, it was a different story. They sat there in total silence. They could not believe what they just saw. Was the game actually over? Did the Generals actually win? That's impossible. There has to be more to the game. It's just a trick. And then they're going to come up with some crazy rule about how that last shot doesn't count. Or they're going to make up some weak excuse for why they have to play overtime where the Globetrotters will end up victorious. Some kids actually started crying. And then after a prolonged silence, the crowd started to boo the Globetrotters. I mean, how in the world did they lose? The generals knew enough to get into the locker room as quickly as possible before they got pelted with popcorn. So they celebrated their victory in an old dingy locker room. They didn't have any champagne on hand, so they doused each other with orange soda, which was all they had. When Klotz was asked about the game later and the crowd's reaction to it, he said, it was like killing Santa Claus. And that is how a new phrase got started. It's not a very popular phrase, but I have heard it said. It is used when a low-level team somehow beats a very powerful team. The phrase goes like this, sometimes the Washington Generals do win. In that, they wanted to bring Mikan back into the organization as the new general manager. Mikan accepted and put everything he had into trying to restore the greatness of the Lakers. And one of Mikan's first moves was to hire himself as the new head coach of the team. Well, that did not work. He went 9-30 and as the head coach, and the team fired him from both roles. Again, he was out and trying to figure out what to do next. Just two years later, the new owners, Bob Short and Frank Ryan, decided to relocate the team to Los Angeles, where they became the Los Angeles Lakers. Mikan decided to go back into law, even though he did not like it very much, because it paid well. So he did that for nearly a decade 
when a new opportunity came up to get back into basketball. A new professional basketball league was launching called the American Basketball Association, or ABA, and they wanted to make a splash. They decided that hiring George Mikan to be their first commissioner would be a way to give the new league instant credibility. But Mikan insisted that the ABA headquarters be located in Minneapolis so that he would not have to relocate, and the ABA owners agreed. Mikan was involved with the decision to use the red, white, and blue ball, and he was also involved in adopting the three-point line for this new league. But after two years, the ABA owners fired Mikan and moved the ABA headquarters to New York, which is where they had wanted it originally. With that, Mikan was out of basketball again, and he continued working in law and making public appearances. Now let's fast forward to 1996 when the LA Lakers signed Shaquille O'Neal as a free agent. Sports Illustrated had an idea for a photo shoot that would show Shaq as the next one in a long line of great Lakers centers. The original idea was to get George Mikan, Will Chamberlain, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to put on their Lakers uniforms from their own eras and to stand behind Shaq who would be wearing the current Lakers uniform from 1996. Chamberlain declined, but Mikan and Kareem both thought it would be a lot of fun. The final photo shows Shaq seated backwards in a chair with Kareem and Mikan standing behind him with their arms folded. As a Lakers fan, I thought it was one of the coolest pictures I had ever seen. But that photo shoot is where an amazing friendship developed between Mikan and Shaquille O'Neal, and they would stay in contact with each other. And I will say this for Shaquille O'Neal, he has a great respect for the Hall of Famers that came before him. As Mikan's health declined, he eventually moved to Scottsdale, Arizona in 1999 where he lived out his final years and he finally passed away on June 1st, 2005 at the age of 80. Shaq was playing with the Heat at the time and he interrupted his post-game interview to directly address the Mikan family. Shaq said, quote, if the Mikan family is watching, please contact the Heat office because I'd like to pay for the funeral. I know who he was, I know what he did. Without George Mikan, there is no me, unquote. As a person who loves basketball history, I am fully aware that many of the young players have no clue about the greats from prior generations, but Jordan did, so did Kobe, so does LeBron, and so does Shaquille O'Neal. It was a great way for the most dominant big man of his era to honor the most dominant big man of a previous era. Without George Mikan, there is a chance that the NBA does not exist today. The NBA was not always the multi-billion dollar league that it is today. Back in those early days, they had to scratch and claw for attention and revenue. But Mikan helped with that. Everywhere he played, he sold out arenas. He was a must-see player. He was not the only star of his day. There were other players like Bob Davies, Paul Arizon, Dolph Shays, and Bob Pettit. But Mikan stood taller than all of them, not just physically, but metaphorically as well. So that does it for today. I hope you all have a deeper appreciation for what George Mikan meant to the NBA in those early years when things were not so stable financially. He gave the league solid footing. Join us next time when we share the story of how basketball players became known as cagers. Where did that name even come from? Well, that's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And go check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There, you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! 
soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.